Friends, good morning. Uh, my name is Tony Sundermeyer. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, let me welcome you to this hour of worship. We're so thankful uh, to be together. We have been saying throughout this uh, time as we've started to open the church up again for worship in person, we've been saying all along that we're one church, whether we are uh, in person or worshiping remotely, and we're thankful for the technology and the team that uh, week in, week out, uh, makes it uh, accessible for us to worship uh, in that way. Uh, a special welcome to those of you who might be with us for the very first time. We do hope and pray that you feel connected uh, to this congregation, but most certainly connected to uh, the Spirit of God who meets us wherever we are. Uh, we would be encouraged if you let us know that you're worshiping with us today. The way you do that is uh, through text message. Uh, you can take out your cell phone, whether you're at home, uh, worshiping live stream or worshiping on demand, uh, or if you're in the sanctuary, we encourage you. It's a great time to silence your cell phones uh, and to let us know that you're here. Uh, if you've never used this platform before, you are going to open up your message portal uh, where it says two, you're going to type the number 313131. That's 313131. And in the message bar, you're going to type the number 1ST. So first, 1ST, text that to the number 313131. We would uh, also encourage you to text, uh, if you've used this before rather, uh, text the word check-in, C-H-C-K-I-N, uh, to that same number, 313131. Text check-in to 313131. When you do that, we'll send you a digital copy of our bulletin in order for worship. Uh, you can click that link and follow along. If you're in the sanctuary with us today, there are no hard copies of the bulletin, so you either have to get it that way, or you'll have to um, go to our website, First Pres ATL, scroll down where the worship link is, uh, and then click the bulletin button, and then you can follow uh, the liturgy and flow of worship. Uh, in that way. Also, the back of the bulletin, there's ways to find out what's happening in the life of the church and ways to get connected in the life of the church, even during these challenging COVID-19 times. Well, friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, and let us now prepare our hearts for the worship of God. Scriptures say that people will come from east and west, from north and from south to sit at table in the kingdom of God. Our worship today is a foretaste of that kingdom. We thank God that God is with us and for us in Jesus Christ, and we come together preparing our hearts and our lives to receive that presence so that we may be encouraged and equipped to be faithful in this day and in the days ahead. Friends, let us stand in body or in spirit and let us worship our God.
worship, we stand before God and humbly confess our sins so that we might receive God's grace. Join me first in our unison prayer of confession and then in a time of silence. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Lord, hear now our silent prayers. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen.
Our first scripture reading comes from the Old Testament, Psalm 123, verses 1 through 4. Listen for and hear the word of God. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eye of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, our God, until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have had more than enough of contempt, our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Elijah, thank you so much for reading. In addition to the text that Elijah read for us, we have an a text from the prophet Zephaniah, a more obscure prophet. Uh, and it's part of the lectionary cycle that comes on a rotational basis every uh, three years. Uh, the, the version that's printed in your digital copy is actually not the version we typically read. So uh, that was just a mistake. And I'm going to read uh, from the new revised standard version, which is the version that we use in our worship uh, week in and week out. Zephaniah 1, beginning with verse 7 and then moving to 12 to 18. Listen to God's word to you and to me. Be quiet. Be silent before the Lord. For the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. God has consecrated God's guests. At that time, says the Lord, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will, I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good nor will God do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath, in the fire of God's passion, the whole earth shall be consumed. For a full, a terrible end, God will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
be seated. And let us pray. Lord, break open uh, the word that you want us to hear. Break open uh, the word afresh to us today so that we would be changed, that we would be different, that we would be moved toward a deeper maturity and faithfulness so that we may even look more like your son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. One of the, the great treasures of the city of Atlanta is the speech school. Uh, since its founding in 1938 by Catherine Ham, we've had many, many children from within this uh, congregation attend the speech school. We've had uh, many members uh, serve the school either uh, in administrative capacities or, or even as teachers. Uh, the speech school's executive director is uh, sort of a household name in Atlanta, Comer Yates, uh, and he's not just well known for his leadership of the speech school, but, but he's also known for his wider ad advocacy as he uh, works for greater ac access and, and more excellence in early childhood education. A few years ago, I was in attendance at a talk that Mr. Yates uh, gave about the critical task of education, and in particular, the task of helping children find their voice. Helping children find their voice. The speech school's tagline is language and literacy for each and every child. And, and Mr. Yates is resolute in his conviction that when a child discovers their voice, when a child learns their voice. They have the power and capacity to decide what kind of future they will inherit. He'll say when a child finds their voice, they learn how to advocate for themselves and they learn how to advocate for other people. When a child learns and finds their voice, that child can shape the world with purpose and with meaning. One of the main themes of Angie Thomas's book, The Hate You Give, a book that's been pretty popular for the last several years and even more so over the course of this year as many young adult readers have taken this book up, whether for uh, their own education or through their uh, schools. Uh, the Hate You Give is, is about a central character, a teenage girl, uh, named Star Carter, who decides that she's no longer going to be silent about the violence she has experienced and seen, about the anti-black violence that she has experienced and she has uh, seen that has shaped her existence. She comes to a point, even against the status quo, even at a great risk to her and her standing in her school and in her larger community, she comes to the point where she says, I can no longer keep silent. She finds her voice. She says, I will never forget. I will never give up. I will never be quiet. I promise. Star Carter is an example of, of, of the kind of child we want to see grow up. We want to see that kind of child possess their voice. We want to see them find their voice and and speak a, a world perhaps that is different than the past, find their voice, keep that promise, and speak up. Of course, we don't just want that for children or for teenagers. We want that for, for everyone. We want that for those whose voices have been buried, those voices that have been silenced by others. We sort of fashion ourselves as, as champions of people finding their voice. I, I think of the words from Madeleine Albright who once said, it took me a real long time to develop a voice, to find a voice, but now that I have it, I'm not going to be silent. And in our time and in, in our society, we, we celebrate that kind of resolve. We celebrate this idea of, of speaking our truth of finding our voice no matter what age you are. It's really hard to find somebody who disagrees with the mantra, find your voice. 
It seems to be, uh, seems to have rather ubiquitous support in our time and our age. I think it's worth noting that this idea of finding one's voice, of speaking one's truth, it is also deeply rooted in our faith tradition. It's deeply rooted in, in the Christian tradition. You just go to the stories of the Bible and you'll see Moses find his voice before Pharaoh. You see the prophets find their voice to speak to the people a word of justice, a word of repentance, of, uh, of finding their voice to call people back to obedience to God. We think of Jesus himself coming out of the wilderness and what is his very first act to inaugurate his ministry? It's a sermon, it's a speech, it is talk, it is proclamation from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He closes and rolls up the Isaiah scroll and he has one more word to offer. Today, in your hearing, this text, this prophecy, this proclamation, this word has been fulfilled. Jesus' ministry begins with talk. It begins with him finding his voice. We think of the birth of the church as well. We think of Acts 2, when the disciples gathered, they were afraid, and yet the Spirit of God descends upon them, and the Spirit gives them a voice. And how is the church born? By the disciples going out of their secluded place into the public space. And what do they do? They talk. They find their voice. They speak and they proclaim the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. We know that as Christians, we're called to proclaim that same good news. We're called to speak the truth in love. We're called to proclaim God's grace and mercy, God's justice and righteousness, God's joy in the Holy Spirit. We're also called not to sweep under the rug abuse or cruelty or, or exploitation, but we're called to speak into those things, into those situations, into those matters. We're called to speak the truth in love. We're called to talk. Each and every week in worship, we find our voice, don't we, in prayer and in songs and in sermons and in fellowship. And, and all of this, all of this is centered into this fundamental conviction that Christians speak because God has spoken. It's not because we just like to hear ourselves talk. It's because we believe that God has definitively spoken once and for all in the law and in the prophets and in the words of the church, but definitively in and as the person of Jesus Christ. As Karl Barth says, because God has spoken, we dare to speak. Christians find their voice. Friends, there is no church, there is no Christianity without proclamation. There is no Christianity without words and without affirmation, without announcement, without speech. This morning, I'm thinking about these things. I'm thinking about finding one's voice. I'm thinking about uh, how much emphasis in our society, in our culture, we, we place on finding one's voice, on speaking our truth. I'm also thinking about it in terms of our own Christian tradition, how our tradition is rooted in proclamation, God's proclamation and our proclamation. I'm thinking about these things as we dare to approach the text from Zephaniah which begins in a way that runs completely counter to everything I just said. It runs in the complete opposite direction. The lectionary text for today begins with these words, be quiet. Hush up, stop talking. The, the Hebrew word is actually pretty forceful here. It actually has more, uh, more sort of symmetry with our English crass and unbecoming, and pardon me, because I know a lot of people don't say this in their home, to tell someone to shut up. 
That's the kind of weight this word has. It's a word that has strength behind it. Keep your mouth shut, keep silence, hold your tongue, stop talking, stop tweeting, stop posting, be quiet, be silent. Zephaniah is actually saying, now is not the time to find your voice. Now is not the time to speak your truth. As much as we do value finding one's voice in, in sort of our society and within our tradition itself, I'm reminded of the words as I think of Zephaniah, I'm reminded of the words of wisdom from Ecclesiastes. You know these words. There's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. No doubt, this is a hard word, but that's what Zephaniah is saying. He's saying that this is a time to be quiet, a time to be silent. And the word only gets harder. It only offends that much more as Zephaniah keeps writing line by line by line because what the prophet lays out is a no holds barred description of impending doom of catastrophe, of destruction, not just for the people of God, but for the whole earth. The reason is because the people have sinned, the people have offended God, they've been, they've been disobedient to God, and God says the prophet will bring distress. It'll be a day of wrath because God hates, God loathes disobedience. God hates it. And there are consequences. There are consequences for disobedience. There are consequences for our sin. It's, it's like what the Apostle Paul writes, those hard words in, in Romans, when he says, the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin, the consequence of sin is death. And, and look, we don't have to beat around the bush on this. We know this is true, right? That sin produces disorder. Sin produces death. Sin produces bloodshed, sin produces division, sin produces oppression, sin disrupts harmony with God, it disrupts harmony with our neighbor, it disrupts the internal harmony that we have with ourself. For Zephaniah, right, this moment of prophecy is a moment to keep quiet and observe the consequences. That's what Zephaniah is asking the people to do, to shut up, and see what has happened. Pay attention to what has become of this world. It's a moment to hold our tongue, to see the suffering, to see the injustice, to see the destruction, to keep quiet and keep seeing it. Keep silent and to, and to feel the full weight of sin, to feel the full weight of devastation and ruin that it leaves in its wake and what it's done to our relationships, what it's done to our internal life and the havoc it wreaks in the communities that we love. Now look, friends, I'll be the first to tell you, no one, no one likes to be confronted with their sin. It's not a pleasant conversation. No one likes to be confronted with the consequence of their sin. No one likes to be told, hey, hold your tongue, sit in silence, keep quiet, stop offering excuses, stop trying to pass the blame, and simply acknowledge. Simply see what has happened. This past week, I was in a Zoom a presbytery meeting, exciting, I know, on the floor of Presbytery was a, was a very uh, difficult matter, very difficult matter. And I had some very, very, very strong feelings about this matter, and I still do. And as they say, I got into my feelings. And I felt anger start to come up and bubble to the surface, and then I, I unmuted myself on the Zoom, and I, I spoke with a, with a measure of harshness, and I spoke with, uh, with threat. And truth be told, it was not my finest moment. As I finished saying what I thought I wanted to say and muted myself, my presbytery colleagues began to speak, and I realized listening to them that I had made 
a huge mistake. I realized what I had said and how I had said it uh, greatly offended a lot of people on the call. And as I sat there on this Zoom call with 300 of my colleagues, elders and pastors alike, and I continued to just listen, keeping myself on mute, listening to follow-up comments, post the one I made, I realized that my words had done some, some real damage. After the meeting, one of my uh, pastoral colleagues from another church reached out to me immediately, someone I respect uh, a great deal, I, I have great respect, rather, for her. She reached out to me and said, hey, I wanna, I wanna talk about what you said. And we created a Zoom link the next day and we, we Zoomed together and, and, and she was uh, every bit as gracious as she was willing to speak the truth in love. And I sat in silence and, and listened. And I observed the hurt. I observed the offense. I submitted myself in silence to it. I knew the right thing to do in that moment was to listen to her and to acknowledge and to see the damage that my words had caused. Now I knew I was preaching on Zephaniah before I committed that sin earlier in the week. Little did I know that I'd have to preach this sermon to me first before I'd preach it to all of you. But it really was for me a Zephaniah moment to be silent and to observe the consequence of my sin. To see it. Again, no, no one likes to be in that position. It's uncomfortable, it's humbling, and it's also absolutely necessary. If you're going to experience healing, if you're going to experience forgiveness, if you're going to experience unity in your own life and in the life of the community, and as a Christian, as a Christian, we hope for these things, right? I mean, this is actually what we hope for. We hope for healing, we hope for transformation, we hope for forgiveness, and we recognize that no one is beyond redemption. We recognize that the world is not beyond saving. We know that Paul said, for the wages of sin is death, but we also remember that he said, the gift of God is life. The gift of God is eternal life, life to the full. For the Christian, we, we not only keep silent, and acknowledge and see what our sin has done, both personally and corporately. But we also keep silent. We also keep silent and look and look for the grace of God. We also keep silent and, and look for the mercy of God. That's why I love the, the text that Elijah read for us from Psalm 123, because it makes this point. The first move the psalmist makes, I don't know if you picked it up as he was reading it, but the first move the psalmist makes is, is not to talk, but to look. Did you catch that? The psalmist says that they lift their eyes to the mercy of God. They don't talk. They observe the mercy and grace of God breaking in to a world that's marred by sin. Not speaking, but seeing that God is merciful, seeing that God forgives, seeing that God makes things new, that God can bring order in the midst of chaos, that God can bring peace in the midst of conflict, that God can bring justice in the midst of injustice, that God can bring wisdom in times of confusion, that God can bring inner balance when we're unsteady, that God can bring forgiveness to our sin to actually see it. But we come full circle. And we remember once again the words of Ecclesiastes that there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. And the psalmist, after looking to God in silence, what do they do? They find their voice. The perfect image for me was Elijah coming up and standing in this pulpit, standing in silence, preparing himself to read the word of God, observing this word. And he was not a plant. He did that all on his own observing the word of God and then finding his voice to speak the word of God to us. The psalmist says, have 
mercy. Have mercy upon us, O God. Friends, there is a time to find our voice in all of this. There is a time. There's a time to break the silence and say, God, I need your grace. There's a time to say, God, our world needs your grace. God, our nation needs your grace. God, we need your mercy. We need your forgiveness. We need your strength to make a change, to go a different direction, to make a fresh start. Friends, mature faith discerns when it's time to speak and when it's time to keep silent. Mature faith knows there is a time to be quiet, to hold our tongue and to see the brokenness of our lives and the brokenness of the world, mature faith knows that there's a time to keep quiet and to listen and to learn and to understand. There's a time to stop blaming and a time to stop making excuses. But mature faith also knows that there's a time to find our voice. There's a time to cry out to God. There's a time to ask forgiveness. There's a time to say, I am so sorry. There's a time to, to say, I haven't been at my best. And there is, like my friend did for me, there is a time to speak the truth in love. There's a time to advocate for those whose voice has been silenced or, or pushed to the margins. There is a time to stand up for what's good and what's right and what's godly. There is a time to declare that the world Zephaniah describes is not inevitable, but that another world is possible. There is a time to speak and there is a time to keep silent. And so I leave you with these questions. Where in your life right now are you called to hush up, to stop talking, to stop tweeting, to stop posting, to keep silence and just see things as they really are, to feel the weight of the world as it is? And where in your life is it time to find your voice? To find your voice. To cry out to God. To speak the truth of God and God's coming kingdom. What time is it for you? There is a time to speak. There is a time to keep silent. My hope and my prayer for all of us is that we would know the time and act accordingly. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear God, in a year that is still strange and disrupted, that brings anger and anxiety and fatigue, we turn back to you. We speak to you now with our gratitude and our tenacious hope and our deep need for you. Thank you, God, for this day and for the promise of your mercy that's new every morning. Thank you for weaving us together even when we worship in different places and when we can't see everyone we love. Thank you for receiving our frustration and worry. Thank you for offering us instead your strength and peace that we can't make for ourselves. Thank you for seeing us when we're isolated and calling us beloved. Thank you for taking the pains of our bodies and the grief of our hearts and carrying them for us. Thank you for the gift of this glorious world and the charge to tend it well. Thank you for using our very different gifts for good. Thank you for knowing us, all of us, even our insecurities, and calling us to be your people anyway. God, we hope in you. We remember that your time is longer than ours, that you alone are God, above all political powers and meanness, above all human conflict and threat. God, we need you. This morning, we speak our prayers and we hold some in silence. We pray for families, for students, and for teachers, and for everybody who's trying their best, for all who fight illness, for all who grieve loss and wait for a feeling of closure, for every one of our sisters and brothers struggling this morning to survive, for all who long for steady work and stable homes and good health care and a place to belong, for all who are still listening, hoping for your call and a sense of purpose day to day and for the long run, for those who have power of any kind, God, give them the wisdom to pursue justice and to lead with compassion. God, hear our prayer for all who are weary. Lord, we live in you. Hear these prayers and lift us up through the power of your promise and your relationship that is long and loving. Hear us now as we speak and join our voices with the prayer you taught your disciples. We pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, may we discern the time to speak or to be silent. And in these times, may we be found faithful. And may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, and that peace guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. May his peace live inside of you this day and every day ahead. Amen.
you for watching today's broadcast. For more video content, I'd encourage you to visit our website, firstpressatl.org. We'd love to see you here sometime at the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street to join us for worship. Thanks again for watching.